froze on me. That was weird. Hi. Good morning. How are we? Oh, that's nice. It's very convenient. Uh, we are glad that you have joined us here today, uh, either in person or on the live stream, but we are grateful. We're going to spend some time just praising our, our Father in Heaven and praising His Son and just lifting up our voices to Him. And then, obviously, we'll, we'll spend time just uh, diving into His Word and, and trying to glean information. But before that, let's just approach Him and approach His throne in prayer. Will you guys stand with me? Heavenly Father, we come before your throne. We do this weekly because the sacrifice that your son made covered us eternally, and we are grateful for it. We thank you, and we want to turn back our praise, our worship, our voices to you, to honor you, to honor your son, and it is why we come here, and it is why we, we dive into your word, it is why we search your word for truth and, and, and allow it to affect our lives. It is in your son's holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. We won't fear the battle, we won't fear the night. We will walk the valley with you by our side. You will go before us, you will lead the way. We will find our refuge, only you can say. Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now. The love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Even when I stumble, even when I fall, even when I turn back, still you you will not abandon, you will not forsake, you will cheer me on with a never-ending grace. Sing with joy now, our God is for us, the Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, the love is greater, who can set against us if our God is for us? can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave his son to free us holds me in his love. Neither right nor death can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He Love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now. The love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Sing with joy now. Our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now. The love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us. All right, turn around, say hi to the neighbors, greet the people around you. If you're on the live stream, drop a hi. Simon will see it and he'll say hi back. Why were there bird sounds coming from out there? Strength when I am weak, you will 
treasure that I see, you are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God,
to sit down if, if that's how you choose to continue in worship.
morning. Because God remembers and cares and provides for his people, we should never fear. I'm going to read uh, Luke chapter 12, 6 through 7. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. <clears throat> we have not been forgotten by God. He has not given us life only to desert us. God is aware of the little sparrows, and they are not worth that much. So how much more is he aware of us for whom he gave his only son? The world is a frightening and troubling place right now. Many people are running scared, but God's people should not be because he is with us at all times. The communion meal reminds us that God loves us so much that he gave his only son to die on the cross so we may have a relationship with God. We have nothing to fear, not even death. Since the pandemic, many people have been, been so afraid of dying that they quit living. Think about that. they so afraid of dying that they quit living. Let's pray. Father, thank you for not forgetting us. And as we take this bread and this juice this morning, let us remember that your son died on the cross for our sins and that you are always with us and uh, carrying us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to move this real quick. That'll give me more room to move around in case I want to do some cartwheels. So when I first got into ministry, um, I was living pretty much paycheck to paycheck. And it was stressful. I don't know if you know this about living paycheck to paycheck. It's not, it's not enjoyable. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to dismiss the children. I apologize. Don't, don't take that tone with me. I knew it this. I forgot. I was I actually forgot because I was super stressed because 
my pack, I didn't have my pack ready, and it's not fun to try and like, it doesn't, it's not circle hole, cir like circle peg, circle hole. It doesn't work very well. It's, don't worry about it. It's a frustrating thing. <laughs> I see your face. I'm not losing my mind. Anyway, I was living paycheck to paycheck, all right? <laughs> it's not fun. It's not enjoyable. Um, so I tried to figure out uh, ways, just ways that I could save a bit more money. Um, and in my attempts to become fiscally responsible, I, I stopped eating out at lunch every day when I was at work. I stopped uh, taking the run to go and get Panda, which I love oh so dearly. But I said, no, I'd rather feel a bit more comfortable. So I stopped. Uh, I'm flustered now. The whole pack thing got me off. Um, anyway. So, so yes, um, but one of the other things I did was I, I tried to quit impulse buying things. Like when I saw stuff, you know, I would be like, oh, I want that. No, you probably shouldn't buy that. And, and I, I did pretty good. I, I was able to, to slowly build up an, an amount of money that just in case, you know, something happened with my truck, I could, I could repair it, which lots of things happened to my truck. Um, I didn't have some, some giant, you know, alcove filled with gold, but I, I had a nice, a nice little cushion. But, and I don't think I'm the only one who does this. There are times, though, you see that thing, that one thing, and you're just like, I need this thing. I want, I, I just, I want it. Um, and obviously, there have got to be others who connect with that idea of seeing something and just saying, yeah, I got to have it. No matter how responsible I had become with my money, no matter how controlled I had learned to be, there are always those moments those moments where I saw something and I just had to have it. I needed this thing. Having it was the only way that I could foresee myself ever reaching any level of euphoric joy, any level of actualization, achieving my final form as they joke about in anime. And so I would buy it. I might have regretted it later, but in that moment, in that moment, I had to have it and I felt good that I bought it. And I know, I know I'm not the only person this happens to. I doubt I'm the only person in this room who does this. It's, it's commonplace. It's a common occurrence. And I know it's a common occurrence because there is a meme, a joke on the internet. Uh, it's a picture of a, of a cartoon character and he's holding out a handful of cash and below him the text always says, um, basically just take my money. Um, I'm trying to find the actual wording for it. And I can't believe I can't think of it. Anyway, um, but yes, it's basically, yeah, it's, it's shut up and take my money is the image. Of, and what this is, is everyone uses this when, when someone like posts a funny idea or, or uh, like something they want to see in a TV show or, or this cool invention that would be, you know, it would just make your life easier. People will share this meme of shut up and take my money. And what they're saying is, yes, I don't even care. You don't have to tell me anything else. I, I'm willing to support this financially. I would give you my money if this were a real thing. And they post this meme to support it. They would buy it in a heartbeat. I wouldn't have to think twice about buying it. I wouldn't worry about the cost. I would just buy this thing. I would support this great idea. I need it in my life. This morning, we are going to be continuing in our Kingdom Parable series. And we will be, we'll still be in Matthew chapter 13, but today we will be in verses 44, 45, and 46. The parables of the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price. So right now, I'm going to go ahead and read those verses, and then we are going to pray, and we are going to dive into today's sermon. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Jesus, as we dive into your words, words that you spoke, uh, sermons and lessons that you gave, we, we, we pray for understanding that we can glean bits of information and that those information, that information affects our lives. As we dive into talking about how great and glorious and majestic your kingdom is, let that affect us. Let that change us. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. So we have two parables. Two parables about men who find an amazing treasure. 
and uh, we're going to look at what they do and how they respond. But first, we're going to look at the man in verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in a field which a man found. But why is a man just finding a treasure in a field? It's weird. It's not, you know, I had a field across the street from me when I grew up, and I never found a treasure. We found, like, tumbleweeds and, and, and cigarette butts and other things, but we never found treasure in it. So why is there a treasure in this field? Well, in ancient times, they didn't have banks like we have banks. They didn't have lock boxes. If you wanted to, to store grandma's pearls, you, you wouldn't just, you know, take it to a bank and put it in a lock box and they'd keep it safe there. Um, and if you wanted to store your money, you couldn't just also just take your stuff to a bank. Instead, what you would do is you'd buy an item that is worth um, a lot of money. See, now rich people could actually, you know, invest in and build a nice storehouse for them to keep all their money. I'm, I'm picturing, you know, um, Scrooge McDuck in his giant vault and diving into, into monies of money, but piles of money. But if you were less fortunate, what you would do is you'd take your savings and you'd buy something, something to invest in. That's what we see when uh, we see Mary in John chapter 12, when she comes to Mary and she anoints him with oils. It says that the oils are worth a year's salary. It says 300 denarii. And what, they're, what, what it is is that she had taken that money that they had saved up and they bought this thing because a, a pile of money is harder to take care of than, than a small you know, jar of oil. And that's what she's pouring on him. That's what she's doing there is she's saying, you know, hey, I'm, I'm anointing you with this oil that is worth all of my wages. Um, but that's why she has that. That's what people would do. They would, rather than hide their money under their mattress, um, they would go out and they'd buy something to invest in, something that would hold its worth or maybe even increase in its worth. But... If they died, because sometimes they would go and bury that treasure, like I said, like the guy finds, um, if they died before they could retrieve it, and they hadn't told anybody about its location, it's likely that, that those things got lost and were forgotten. And that is what the man in the parable finds. The first point that I want to illuminate from this parable is that the man was not looking for that treasure. He stumbled upon it. The kingdom of heaven is, is findable, even for those who aren't intentionally looking for it. In 2 Kings chapter 5, we see the story of a man named Naaman. Naaman is a well-liked and well-respected captain in the army of Aram, but he has leprosy, and he is sent to Israel to be healed, and in this process, he finds Elisha. That's Elisha, not Elijah. He's the one who came out after. So, uh, so he finds Elisha, who tells him, hey, go wash uh, seven times in the Jordan River. And Naaman almost doesn't do it. Naaman is offended by this answer. It's not the answer he wants to get. He's like, aren't the rivers back home cleaner than this, than this Jordan River? And he almost doesn't do it. He's mad. But he is convinced by his servants, uh, and he goes and he washes the seven times, and he is healed. He returns to Elisha and tries to offer him money. But Elisha won't take it. But Naaman does ask, hey, if you're not going to take my money, can I at least take uh, two mule loads worth of earth back with me to a ram? He does this because he wants to continue worshiping the true God. That's how he proclaims it. I want to worship this true God. Naaman came to Elisha only to be healed. But he ended up finding a greater treasure, one that he wasn't necessarily looking for. But God is findable. And God is findable without signs and wonders. Psalm 19, verse 1, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. The jaded among us, and, and I include myself in that, um, might joke or roll our eyes and snicker when we see someone post on Facebook a picture of the sunset, and they, they, they attach the caption, God was really showing off this evening. And... Uh, the jaded of, um, among us would be wrong in our reaction to that because there is truth to that. God's kingdable, kingdom is findable from the beauty of his creation. Acts chapter 1 says the same thing, that we can see his, his glory, his majesty, his, his unending properties through creation. We can find his beauty. We can find him through creation. We just have to be willing to open our eyes. So the man finds this treasure. And he hides it again. And he runs off to buy the field. 
Now, I grew up being told that if you found a wallet, you had to, you had to try and return it, or, or you had to, if there was no ID and no way to return it, you had to take it to the police station, and then like 30 days later, if no one had claimed it, you could come and claim it. Um, and I don't know if that's real. I feel like I learned that from television. I feel like it was an episode of Boy Meets World or some other 90s show that was on, thank goodness it's Friday. Um, so I don't know if that's real. If someone can get behind and figure out the legality of that, let me know. But that's what this guy is trying to do. Now, the guy hides the treasure. He's not trying to return it, obviously, but he's trying to make sure that it's legally his. So he hides it again. He goes and he buys the field. And by buying the field, um, he's making sure that this thing legally becomes his. It is legally his. We look at that, and, and we might think, hey, that's a bit shady. Like, he didn't even try to return it. Um, and it is. And Jesus isn't condoning, like, the action of this, but he is condoning the intent. The man is trying to make sure that he can have this treasure. If you've been in my office, you know that uh, lining along the window seal, I have a lot of toys. I call them collectibles. You scoff at me and call them toys. But this is, this is one of the toys that I have. Um, Simon wants it because this is, this is a giant Starscream, and Starscream's his favorite transformer. Um, now, this toy I got the first time I worked at Target. I call it season one. But back in 2005, this is a $45 toy. Um, but it went on clearance. Now, I worked at Target. I worked in the toy department. I saw this thing, and I was like, oh, it's, it's down to like 25 bucks. That's awesome. I'm, I'm going to buy this thing. Um, but I didn't have enough money, and I didn't get paid till next week. So I did what I had to do and what was my job. I put this toy on the clearance aisle, okay? No, I didn't hide it. I, I mean, I put it in the clearance aisle. I also made sure that there were maybe some bigger items in the clearance aisle that were in, in front of it on the shelves. Um, but I put it on, I did, I <laughs> anyway, I got paid. I went back a week later and, and I did buy it. Again, I'm not condoning the action of hiding it because maybe, yeah, maybe that's a little hinky. Maybe, maybe some, you know, 10-year-old kid could have gotten a really great birthday present. But instead, uh, you know, at the time, a 20-year-old kid got a great just random present. But um, I'm not condoning that. It's a little hinky. But that is still, it's still the point. The point is I wanted to make sure that I got it. The man hid the treasure and bought the field because he wanted to make sure that he got it. It may seem sketchy for us, but remember, this is a parable about the kingdom of heaven. So when we put it into that perspective, we see what Jesus is saying is that when you find it, you will also recognize that the kingdom of heaven is desirable. It's worth chasing after. I was organizing my aisles in the toy department. I found this toy, and I knew I had to ensure that I got it. The man who wasn't looking for treasure stumbled upon it. He recognized its value, and he decided it wasn't going to, he wasn't going to let this opportunity slip through his hands. He was going to get that treasure, and he bought the field. But the kingdom of heaven is infinitely better than some cool toy found for a cool price. It's outrageously better than some treasure found in a field. It is worthy of the highest pursuit. And we will talk about that. We will get back to that as we continue in the sermon. For now, I want to switch gears and move on to the man we see in verse 45 and verse 46. See, a man was looking for pearls, and he finds one of great value. Where the man who found the treasure had stumbled upon the treasure in the field, he was not looking for it. This man, we see, is intentionally looking for and trying to find a great treasure. In this instance, a pearl. Now, this guy is a merchant. He is looking for fine pearls so that he can sell them later. And during his search, he is surprised to find a pearl with as much beauty as the one that he found. I don't know why, and it's not even comparable to a man looking for pearls, but when I was a kid, it just reminds me, Saturday mornings in the spring, people were doing spring cleaning, and what that meant is yard sales. My friends and I would get on our bikes, because it was still safe and you were allowed to do that, and we pedaled through the neighborhoods, and, and we would find garage sales every Saturday morning, and we would, we would spend money there, um, and every now and then, 
you'd get to someone's house and, and on their yard they would lay out all the stuff that they were willing to sell, lamps, collectibles, furniture, old clothes, and for some reason people, people were always trying to sell trophies. I don't know why, um, but uh, every now and then you would find something that you were surprised to find. Even while you were looking for you know, these treasures, you found something that you were surprised by. But this, unfortunately, was the fourth or fifth garage sale that you had been to, and you had already spent your, your, your allotment of money, and uh, you needed this thing. So what you would do is you would leave your friends there on the other side of, of wherever we were at, and uh, you'd get on your bike, and you'd pedal back as fast as you, as you could while your friends stayed behind to guard that item. And you'd get home and you'd search under couches, you'd search in the cushions, you'd search everywhere for whatever amount of loose change you could find. You would beg your parents, you would offer them an exchange. If they would just give you this money, I will do all these chores. I just need a little bit of cash. And then you'd get back on your bike and you'd pedal as fast as you could. And while you were still out of breath, you would make the deal with this person on his lawn for this thing that he wanted to get rid of. You made the deal, and you would go home with your reward. My friends and I were looking for great finds. The man in the parable was searching for fine pearls. In both stories, the treasures were found simply because we were looking. In Acts chapter 10, which beautifully enough, we are going to be covering this Wednesday on Mic Drop. Sorry for the shameless plug. But we will meet Cornelius. Cornelius is a man in the Roman army, and he was in charge of several hundred men, but he was chasing after something else. He is described as being a man of God. He is described as being God-fearing. And when we see him, uh, he's keeping the Jewish hours of prayer. He is giving alms to Jewish people, but he, but he himself is an Italian a Gentile. Maybe, maybe, maybe he's a proselyte of the gate, but he's definitely not a proselyte of righteousness. But we see him praying to God regularly. He is searching, and his search is rewarded. An angel appears to him and tells him to go send men down to Joppa and get a man named Peter. Cornelius, a man who by birth would have, should have been distant to God, God revealed himself to him because he was searching. The kingdom is revealed to its seekers. Those, to those who are looking for something better. And both the merchant and Cornelius were looking for something better. Cornelius would have grown up worshiping the Roman gods, the same gods that we see mentioned uh, a few weeks ago when we did the, the sermon and we talked about Paul's sermon on, on Mars Hill. Those are the gods that Cornelius should be serving, but he was dissatisfied with his pagan roots, with the gods of his family, the gods of his ancestors. He wanted something better, something truer, something powerful, and he was willing to throw away all of his old habits and all of his old understandings for a better one. The merchant that was searching for pearls was searching for something beautiful and worthy of his money, and when he found it, he sold everything that he had in order to obtain it. How many other jewels and trinkets did he sell? How many other pearls might he have sold? Pearls that he had already owned and already obtained, did he sell in order to obtain this one beautiful, incomparable pearl? In the parable of the treasure found in the field, the man recognized that his treasure had worth and was willing to sell everything to buy the field. But the merchant, he already had treasures. He had a living. But when faced with this thing of inscrutable worth, he realized that it was better than everything else he had. He sold it to buy it. See, the kingdom isn't just desirable, as we mentioned before and wrote down in our blanks. The kingdom is more desirable. It is more desirable than the treasures that the merchant already had. It is more desirable than the philosophies and the idols that Cornelius had grown up with. It is more desirable than the faith that Cornelius had been attempting to imitate. The kingdom is superior. And it is because of this superior, this, this, this greater value, this recognizable worth that men in both parables sell everything they own in order to obtain these treasures. 
The one man buys the field so that the treasure would legally become his, so that even if someone comes to take it from him because he merely found it, he is protected legally and it cannot be stripped from him. The merchant runs off and sells all of his wares that would be used to support him and his family in order to buy this one beautiful, perfect, superior pearl. In both parables, these men would most likely go on to sell the items they found in order to make their profit back, in order to cover the cost of everything they sold. And as a preaching professor once told me, even, even the best illustrations break down somewhere because unlike what the two men would eventually do once you get past the parable, we, we don't sell the kingdom because we, we've gained the kingdom. There is nothing that we can trade the kingdom for that will ever be better. The kingdom of heaven is priceless. It is worth the greatest efforts, the greatest sacrifice. Paul, in Philippians chapter 3, lists off all the things that were attributed to him as great. And he was, the, he was of the tribe of Benjamin, which meant he could trace his lineage. He was circumcised on the eighth day, which meant his parents upheld the, the, the precise details of the law. He was a Pharisee, which to us, we, we hear that and we think that's bad, but the audience that he was talking to would understand the amount of honor that he could claim to by claiming and holding on to being a Pharisee. He, according to the law, he had grown up to his whole life knowing, loving, training to be the best at. He was found blameless. But all of these accolades that he could have pointed to to gain him honor all of them he found to have no worth in comparison to the kingdom of God. Our Bibles say the word, I consider it all, rubbish. Now rubbish is a, is a, a nice, polite way of saying the word that, that Paul probably actually meant. Um, the Greek word is skibalon, and it doesn't just mean trash, it means dung. All the things that could give him honor from a worldly perspective is fecal matter in comparison to the kingdom of heaven. And so, in all of this, I have a question. A question that you need to answer for yourselves. Is that how you view the kingdom? Do you view the kingdom as priceless? Does the way that you live your lives, does the way that you spend your time, does the way that you speak to and interact with others line up with a manner that shows that the kingdom of heaven is priceless to you? Do our lives serve as witnesses to the overwhelming, incomparable glory of the kingdom of heaven? If a man were to be walking in a field, not looking for great treasure, stumbled upon your life, would he recognize that he needed what you had? If a man uh, had an aimed search and was looking for fine pearls, saw your life at the market stall, would that merchant trade everything because he saw that you had what he needed? That's the message. That's, that's the message that we need to bear to the world. That is the aim of our lives as Christians, that others see us and see we have something that they need. Go and show the world the superior worth of the kingdom of heaven. Please pray with me. Jesus, your kingdom is priceless. It is superior. We will long and strive to live our lives in a way that shows that. Please help us clean up the things that need to be cleaned up. Help us uh, adjust our priorities in a way that they can be adjusted so that we can chase after you and chase after your kingdom. And, and help us just simply to recognize, to take simple joy. As the man who, who found the treasure did, he, he saw this treasure and because of the joy that it brought him, he sold everything. Let us be prepared to sell everything. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Please, please stand with us as we sing uh, this song. It is, a, it is a hard song to sing when you, when you think about the implication of it. Um, this song, I Surrender All. I want you to lift it up as a prayer, and I, will, I want you to, to mean it or be willing to mean it.
And by that I mean, uh, if, if you don't know if you can step into that, that thing, just spend time in prayer just asking that you can get to that point where you can surrender all. Oh, to Jesus I surrender all. To him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I I know. 
song to close out this service. Um, I just want to encourage you that as you go out, remember to, to adjust your life that shows that the kingdom of heaven is of great worth, that the kingdom of heaven is priceless to you. Other people should see your life and be able to see at least that simple fact. So I challenge you to go out as you live your life this week that people um, can see by the way that you live the value, the worth of God's kingdom. Um, remember uh, afterwards to go and, and pick up your children. We need uh, volunteers to sign up for and to uh, mow the lawn. We need volunteers to help uh, clean up the, uh, the church during the week. Um, so there's a sign-up sheet down on the bulletin board for that. If you could do that, if you have time. But um, that's it. Otherwise, uh, pray with me, and then we will do this song, and you will be dismissed. Jesus, I can't say it again. I can't say it enough. Your kingdom, your kingdom that you have invited us into is of great value. It is worthy of all that we have, all that we can ever possess Help us to move into a direction that, that shows that, that, that allows us to come to that understanding that if we were to lose everything, we would still have you and we would still have everything. That's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. When I am weak, you are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. I'm seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, but be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God. Amen. Mm -hmm.
guys are dismissed. We cannot wait to see you back here again next week. Take out into the world the treasure that is God's kingdom.